Proverbs 1, please. Proverbs chapter 1. All right, we are moving our discussion on from Gnosticism and agnosticism to a discussion of theism and atheism. And I'm not sure how long we will spend on this particular discussion, but I've got a couple things I've printed off here and then several notes that I have that I want us to start off with. What is... Uh, what is theism? Anybody got a definition for theism? Okay, belief in a God. I'm not going to write all that out, but just a generic kind of belief in a God. Now, when you throw an A in front of it, a little prefix, what does that prefix A do to theism? It negates it. What did you say, Jeff? Yeah, it takes it away. So, atheism, well, I'll read it to you in their words. Let, let me say this, since I said that, let me say this. How many of you in a conversation that you've had with somebody or that you're having with somebody like it when you are misunderstood and misrepresented? How many enjoy that? I, I love it when that happens. I hope you're picking up on my sarcasm. I love it when people don't pay attention and when they lie about you and say, and this is a big one, and I found this to be true, particularly in religious discussions over the years. When you are having a discussion with someone and they're not paying attention, or, and here's what happens, I think, a lot of times, and in particular with religious discussions, people don't listen to learn. They listen to reply. They just want to say what they want to say. They're not interested in what you have to say. They want to argue, and they want to win the argument. That's what, most, that's what a lot of people in terms of religious discussions care about more is, I'm going to get my point across. What you say really doesn't matter. Uh, there's an interview that you can watch, and this, this is something that's been viewed millions of times. You will say something, and this actually has happened to me quite a few times. And somebody will say, so what you're saying is, and then they don't have, they, they don't say anything close to what you were saying. So if you're in a discussion with somebody and they say, so what you're saying is, and then they say what they want to, what they want you to have said, that happens all the time. So if you go to YouTube, if you want to see this, a prime example of this, Go to YouTube and watch an interview between a guy named Jordan Peterson and a lady named Kathy Newman. And it, I mean, this thing went viral uh, because the entire interview, he's making his point. They're talking about the, the female, gen, the, the gender pay gap, how females make less money. And he would make a point and she would say, so what you're saying is, and his next line is, no, that's not what I'm saying. That, so if you want a little bit of entertainment, about a 30-minute interview, you, you'll get a good laugh out of it. You'll see what I'm talking about tonight. So I'm going to let atheists define for you what they are. What, so let me ask you this. What would you say an atheist is? How would you define that term? Anybody? Okay, someone who has no belief in a God whatsoever. Anybody else got anything? No belief in a higher power? Okay, somebody who believes in the tangible world, materialists, naturalists, all right? This is from an atheist. This is actually, I think, I think the website was atheist.org. To be clear, atheism is not a disbelief in gods or a denial of gods. It is a lack of belief in gods. That seems like hair splitting to me, if you, ask, if you were to ask me. It's not a disbelief or a denial of gods. It is a lack of belief in gods. And I'd printed a second article off, 
and this was from another, a different atheistic website, uh, and it says the same thing. The prefix a means without or lack of, therefore atheism means without a belief, <clears throat> without a belief in a God or gods, or the lack of a belief in God. So those two, I didn't go any further than that, those two are consistent. It's not that we deny God exists or disbelieve it, we just lack the belief in it. I'll just tell you, I don't see the difference. And I'm not trying to be um, dismissive of what they're saying. I just don't see the difference. Maybe I'm a little dense. I don't know. But that's their definition. So we'll go with it, okay? It is a lack of belief in God. So the Christian is, an, is not an atheist because we believe in the existence of God. So let me ask you this. In your opinion... What are the strongest arguments for the existence of God? All right, you got creation. I've talked about some of these things in this class. What else? Morality, Morality. okay. What else? Hmm. Functionality. Function of body, let's say. That would be, that would be the ontological argument. Ontology is, is the argument from design and function. Ontology is the fancy word. Function of body. Any other strong evidences for the existence of, we'll just use their language, a higher power? Okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll write it. Ontology. The, the universe, the physical, the cosmos. How about that? That word work for you? Okay. Arche and I guess specifically, maybe you're referring to the Bible and evidences of God's word. So archaeology. Archaeology. Okay, so think about atheism. So you guys have heard me use words like this in sermons. Some people may be not moral, they are amoral. Or somebody may come, you've heard me say this in sermons, someone who comes from an a-religious background. So they're lacking those things. They're lacking morality. They're lacking religion. Well, an atheist is lacking a belief in God. So we have... Anybody else got anything? Your strongest thought in the arguments for the existence of God. Creation, morality, function of the body, ontology, archaeology, which these two, these two are similar, but we're, we're talking here in terms of ontology, the cosmos, creation. Anybody else? Sir? Okay, science. You know, it's interesting. Sarah shared a video with me about, we, we got to talking a little bit about uh, Charles Darwin last week and what influenced him. Yeah, somebody on here says, the world around us, the amazing bodies we have. Strong, that's strong. Design, purpose, function, things like this. So we got to talking a bit about Charles Darwin last week. Of course, his book, <coughs> The Origin of Species, was a major contributor to, to atheistic evolution, natural processes. He was on his way to become a, a clergyman, and he took this little trip to the Galapagos Islands on the HMS Beagle, and his observations with what he saw there convinced him of natural selection and the pro the you know, the slow changes over time of, you know, adaptation. Let's use that word, adaptation. Uh, where was I going with that? Okay, beliefs, arguments for belief in God. And I, I believe all of these are strong, too, arguments for the existence of God. I want somebody to read Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. As I've been preparing for this class, I... I've thought about this one before, but I'd never really dug much into it, and I did a, 
a lot more digging on it this week. So I'm going to present you with another argument for the existence of a higher power. Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. Okay, so from the atheistic perspective, ultimately, what are we? What is everything? What is everything? What are including us? What are we? Just matter. There you go. Matter that came from an extremely small infinitesimal amount of matter, 4.6, anywhere from 4.6 to 5 billion years ago. And by the way, 4.6 to 5, what's the time space between those two numbers? Isn't that about 400 million years? That's not small, as far as I can tell. 400 million is not a small amount of time. So that's a major discrepancy, in my opinion. All right, so pro this cap. Okay, I've got notes all around the edges of my pages here I want us to pay attention to. Okay, so here we go. Richard Dawkins, you guys have heard of him. I don't know if you have or not. A leading atheistic evolutionist. He's one that is often referred to as a militant atheist. All right, he's out in the streets, you might say. Things like this. Here's a quote from him in, in reference to us humans. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. So it's nothing but, we are nothing but neurons, chemical processes of the brain firing back and forth. And when we die, you know, those processes stop, and so we die, and that's, that's it. There's nothing beyond matter. There's nothing beyond the material, the natural. Well, atheism the lack of a belief in God, here are two, re th two reasons. I made a third one. Th and this is from an atheist writing this. Uh, sometimes theists are thoroughly perplexed by atheism. The way they see the world not believing in a God is bizarre, bordering on madness. So let's look at why people are atheists. There are several reasons people lack a belief in gods, and it's always lowercase g, we will discuss just two. Well, if there are a bunch of them, why not discuss them all? If your intention is to inform us as to why you are atheistic, why only give me two? Reason number one was some people are atheists simply because they have never been taught to be theists. Okay? So what would you call that? Ignorance? Your, <laughs> your atheistic out of ignorance, perhaps. Number two, some were taught to believe in a God, but decided it didn't make sense, so they abandoned their belief. Those are their two reasons why people are atheists. My third reason was, there's no reason to bother believing in any God. Why bother? So, we, like I said, I don't want to misrepresent anybody. I don't want to be misrepresented. And so we're not going to do that. Here's another reason, or another reason, another argument for the existence of God. And this may be, it may be, I'm not saying it is, more powerful than any of these. And it's logic. Somebody read, whoever read that, read verse 7 again. Proverbs 1, 7. Anybody, I don't care. Knowledge, wisdom, instruction. Where did the capacity to learn come from? 
if we are all matter, if we're just DNA dancing to music, if we're just ultimately matter, and when we die, we just turn into less, a smaller amount of matter, where did the capacity to learn, to understand, to reason come from? One of the words I've used in this as we were talking about Gnosticism and agnosticism is consciousness. You and I are conscious beings. That is, we're awake, we're alert. Non, non, inanimate things such as rocks. That's, that's the easiest one to jump to. Um, things of the physical creation are not conscious beings. They have no capacity to learn, to understand, to gain wisdom. Yet, they're, you think of things like, okay, trees, grass, the vegetable kingdom, let's say it that way. They have the capacity to grow and produce, don't they? And reproduce. I mean, they, you, in Genesis chapter 1, if you're going to believe the Bible, if you're going to believe the Genesis account of creation, they have the capacity to reproduce, but what are they learning and understanding? What, what does a... Uh, Ken Royster, what does a tomato plant learn throughout its life? What does a tomato plant learn throughout its life? You, you ever stand up there and teach it anything? No. no, okay. Well, maybe you could get more if you would do that. I mean, it, but seriously, what those things are inanimate objects. They don't have a conscious existence. They don't know they're living and they're growing and they can understand wisdom and knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So when you think about logic, all right, if there is no higher being, if there is no higher power with an intelligence and an, with an intellect and an intention, if we're all just the result of matter, then where did the capacity to have to, to, be, to become logical beings come from? Right? Logic. I wrote these definitions down, but maybe I should have written things in order. <laughs> I'm sorry? Sure. Logic and morality, absolutely. Right. That's really, uh, yeah, that's a good word, rebellion. Right. That's exactly right. Okay, I found the definitions. <laughs> Logic is the science of formal principles of the formal principles of reasoning. Well, so what's it mean to reason? To reason means that you have the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments. Well, that's Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so Proverbs lays that out throughout the really the first six chapters. Um, wisdom is personified as a woman crying out in the streets. I think that's in chapter 6. She's crying out to people. Pay attention to me. Get, get me. Get understanding. Get wisdom. Things like this. Well, again, these inanimate objects that matter does not have this capacity. Now, we can look at matter, okay? We can look at creation, ontology, function of the human body, uh, science, and we can see order, complexity, functionality. We can see all that in that stuff. But if you have a potted plant and you set it on the table, it's not going to say anything and it's not going to learn anything. It may grow. It may have the capacity to reproduce, but that's it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, my cat can shake hands. You got to see that. It's probably something. Sure. They have instinct. We have instinct. Natural. It's it's built within us. But does that not speak to something else that has the capacity to think and react or act? Okay. Yeah. 
Some, there's a, I've read that in a book somewhere, that we're made in the likeness of God. Right. Emotions, the existence of emotions. Where did emotions come from if we're just matter? I never, I've never seen a tree cry or laugh. All right, let's do this real quick. So logic and reason. Did you have your hand up? Oh. Uh, think about it this way. <clears throat> So, according to the Genesis account of creation, on what day was man created? Day six, right? Okay. What is this right here? Gravity. Did gravity exist before day six? God created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is. On day six, He created man in His image. There are things that existed. Logic, laws, let's, say, let's use that word, laws, existed before man existed. Now, we're told in atheism and naturalism, we're told that uh, humanity is just a couple hundred thousand year old, a couple hundred thousands of years old. Did the law of gravity exist before Isaac Newton formulated it in 1687. If a human being was alive in 1685 and jumped off of a building, would that human being have died had the fall been high enough? Yes. Laws existed. What do laws speak to? A lawgiver. Now, if we... So, Reggie answered that correctly. If, but, Reggie, if you and I... If morality is subjective, which is what a lot of people believe, it's up, your morality is up to you, my morality is up to me. Did morality exist before mankind existed? If, if it's true that from the atheistic perspective, we're only a couple hundred thousand years old and everything else is millions and even billions of years old, it had to. Because the capacity to reason doesn't just pop into existence out of matter, out of material. All right, so Proverbs 1, 7 again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Logic existed before man. Laws existed before man. All right, so we have gardens. We plant trees. We do things. And there are laws that, that propagate the life of those things. But those laws existed before man existed. The laws of reproduction existed before God created man himself, didn't they? Just read the first 24 verses of Genesis. The universe exists, the world is round. All right, there was a, I saw a video recently of a guy who, who got a, I don't know if you'd call it, I don't think it's a typical hot air balloon, but he got, he strapped himself, I don't know how this worked out, but he did it, to a balloon and was going so high so he could film that the earth was flat. Well, he got rather disappointed because it's not. And he actually disproved what he was trying to prove. Was the world round before man existed? Yeah? Yes? The laws that govern the function of the natural universe existed before man existed. If it's all just matter, if it's all just material, from where did those laws come? They had to come from someone or something higher, intelligent, with the capacity to function, and uh, that's not... That there, there's no good explanation for any of that in materialism, in atheistic evolution, in theistic evolution. You know, there are Christians who believe in God, but they also try to harmonize God with creation because there's no way this just happened in six days. And listen, this is a matter... I believe that believing in the six-day account of creation is a matter of fellowship. Because you would have to deny 
the Genesis record of the account of creation. It, it was either... So, okay, we're talking of laws. Think about it this way. Uh, <laughs> do you fall... When, <laughs> It's kind of a, I wrote this question down. I was reading an article, and I thought, that's pretty funny. Are you afraid of falling down or falling up? Do you fall up? Well, up the stairs. Thank you. I was waiting. I knew. I'm going to risk Sharon. <laughs> you don't fall up. You fall down. Okay, so again, back to these arguments of law and things like this, and the ability to have logic and reason, where did that come from in, an, in a material universe? Those things are not, one person was writing about this, and he says you cannot open your refrigerator and, and pull out a bottle of reason, a bottle of logic. It's not a material thing. It's not tangible. It, it has to do with the mind and consciousness. If, and if all of that exists, then there has to be a bigger, more powerful uh, some would use the word infinite mind that brought all of that to be. Um, okay, so Tristan talked about morality. Atheism is not compatible with morality. Why is that the case? Listen to it. Atheism is not compatible with with morality. Why is that the case? Survival of the fittest, right? And that's that's one of the I don't know if you call it a pillar, but that's one of the main thoughts of atheistic evolution. That's how we got here. It's survival of the fittest. Survival of the strongest. Morality has to come from somewhere. The, the Christian standard of morality is Scripture. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, all of these arguments for the existence of God, I think some of them do overlap somewhat, but again, I, I think when you get down to it, the ability to use logic, to come to conclusion. Okay, so here's a, here's a rule of logic. All right? A thing either is or is not. So, I have this quote here, and uh, here it is. This issue is the single biggest misunderstanding about atheism. Fortunately, there's a neat way to show why it's wrong. A God either exists or does not. There's no third option. It's, it's called the law of the excluded middle. A thing either is or is not. All right? Two plus two is what? It's never anything else, right? I know that's an, probably an oversimplified illustration, but it illustrates it well enough. It either is for or it is not for. Well, a God either exists or it doesn't. There are only two possibilities. When you look at the abundance of evidence for the existence of a, again, using their language, a higher power, a higher being, when you look at all of this evidence, now, now, here's the thing, and I, maybe Tammy touched on this earlier. Atheism in general, maybe I should say, um, maybe more uh, militant atheism is just very dismissive of all this. Oh, that's not, you know, I can explain all that away. But I would say honest atheism, those who honestly lack a, lack a belief in the existence of a god, could be convinced if they're honest. And that, that's the thing, honesty. 
If you're just, if you're an ideologue, an ideologue is a person who grabs onto something, grabs onto a system of belief, and just holds on to it because they're just because they're going to hold on to it. You're not, you're not going to get anywhere with a person like that, whether we're talking about atheism, whether we're talking about denominationalism, whatever the case may be. You don't want, you don't want to deal with an ideologue because you're not going to get anywhere. They're not reasonable. They don't use logic. They're going to hold to something because they want to hold to something. But when you present an honest person with all this evidence, and I think that's a good word for it, I don't know. I'm, I used to think maybe creation was the <clears throat> strongest argument for the existence of God, but I lean more, the more I've studied this, more towards logic and reason. The capacity to think, understand, come to conclusions based on evidence. Uh, there's, something, there's something to that, to something to the strength of that argument. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Something I started to say earlier, and somebody mentioned it in the comments here. Um, by use of Bible, I don't believe the earth to be any more than 10,000 years old. Before Darwin and a couple of the guys that influenced him, most of your scientists believed in God and believed in creation. It wasn't until you have this idea of great expanses of time. You know, well, you need however many eons of time for this to evolve into this. Before that thinking process started, most of your scientists were theists. They believed in God, in a God at least. Uh, somebody read Romans 1, 18 through 22, please. His eternal power, and the King James, if I'm not mistaken, I think the King James and the New King James both say Godhead. Is that right? His eternal power and Godhead. Another way to understand that word is hood, Godhood. You've heard me talk about that before. Godhead, Godhood, is those are the attributes that make God, God. Okay, so when you look at Romans chapter 1, and I didn't turn my Bible over there, so give me just a minute. When you look at Romans chapter 1, uh... Verse 19, because that which may be known of God, notice how that's stated. That's stated, um, in, in the Greek it's called the subjunctive mood. It may be known. It's a possibility. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it to them. And these are the two invisible things of God that can be known by the creation. They can cl be clearly seen because they're understood by the things that are made his eternal power, and his, his divine nature. I think some of your modern English versions actually translate that, his divine nature. Okay? So that they are what? Without excuse. So Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about physical creation, and he says those that even deny his eternal power and divinity have no excuse to do that. There's no reason to, to deny the existence of a higher being. And here's the problem. Because when they knew God, and I was reading another article, and I didn't print it off, but it was written by a, a person who claims to be a Bible-believing Christian, but his, his take on it is, based on Romans chapter 1, there is no true atheist because of what Paul says here. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. How can you look at the complexity and functionality of the universe and deny intelligence, deny creation, deny purpose? 
Well, because you have a foolish heart that's darkened. And when you look down at verse um, 24, God gave them up. Verse 26, God gave them up. Verse 27, God gave them over. He let them go their own way. Um, so, any other questions or comments on anything we've said? There has to be a beginning. Well, the advancements in science have, in, in my opinion, contributed to the evidence for the existence of God. They've certainly not taken away from it. All right, we've got to stop there, but we'll, we'll pick up on this next week uh, talking about... Um, talking. Here, listen to this quote, and then I'll stop. If we look at countries where most people are atheists, we can see that the allegations that they are immoral is untrue. All you have to do is point to 20th century Russia and Germany. Real quick. I don't know. That's, a, that's my answer. I don't know how old it is atheism. You know, a lot of people, and I've talked about this in sermons before, a lot of people cite uh, Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And that's not... A right translation. You look in your King James or your New King James, there is, is in italics. It says, the fool has said in his heart, no, God. He doesn't deny that God exists. He just tells God, no. Oh, my stars, what? <laughs> Sixteen. so 1500s, you have that word atheist, okay. All right, we'll stop there and we'll pick up next week. Thanks, guys.